Hello, Neuro Plasticians. I'm here with Jaten Patel today to speak about neurodiversity. Jaten, how are you, my friend? I'm very well, thank you. It's a beautiful day in London today. Oh, a, a rare treat. I'm hoping it lasts over the weekend. So, Jaten, tell us a bit about your work in neurodiversity. This is a very hot topic at the moment. It is very important that we have an understanding how this fits into the fundamentals of neuroplasticity, how your work is relevant to the other people in this domain in the NPN hub and the other neuroplasticians. So <clears throat> tell us the story, tell us the origins, tell us about the book or the books. Um, so tell us about you, Jet, and how, how can we start? So I, I think I'm going to start way back when. Um, Very good. Back in the day. Time, <laughs> once upon a time, in a financial services organization, I was working in the treasury operations function. Okay. And uh, it involved me having to place funds with people, uh, with banks around the world, um, in order to ensure that we, had, you know, uh, we didn't go overdrawn or we didn't place too much money with other banks where we created transactions for clients. Okay. I found myself in a situation where you know, regularly, uh, I would be uh, misappropriating. Misappropriating is the wrong word, actually, but misplacing funds. So, and the Ooh, reason it sounds it, like a dangerous thing to do. Yeah, it, well, it was because that meant that sometimes with certain banks, we were overdrawn and we're talking to the tune of millions um, or hundreds of thousands. And sometimes mm -hmm. we had too much money in other banks. And the reason it was happening was, be, and I didn't know at the time, but I, I had I have dyslexia. And okay. it, one of the ways that manifests for me is the transposition of numbers. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know. Isn't it so, called num numeric lexia? What is it called? Isn't there a special name for it? Uh, well, I mean, for me, it's a part of a, the wider condition where, for example, you know, sometimes I think about do I write a C, you know, that way around or that way around? Um, okay. It, it, so, but this is part of the wider condition. And uh, as a result, you know, sometimes in, instead of placing $2.3 million with the Mellon Bank of Pittsburgh, I end up placing uh, $3.2 million. And, oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, but it's like at the time in the corporate world, people didn't recognize that this was actually a cognitive condition. Um, and it was like, you're being careless. Why are you making mistakes, um, which are very simple and straightforward? Uh, and uh, I, th I, you know, I, th I was thinking about this to myself and thinking, wow, you know, it happened uh, maybe, you know, a handful of times over a period of three months, but that was enough for me to sort of think, ah, oh, okay. But if my boss at the time had had a better understanding of um, neurodiverse conditions perhaps i wouldn't have had quite such a rough ride in that particular role as i did mm, um, and also it, you know i at that time you know there were not really that many assessments for assessments for dyslexia uh, exactly. in, in the workplace but you know stepping forward now um what i've seen and uh, you know particularly since lockdown is that uh, there's a much greater awareness. And uh, I like to think of it as different thinking styles when I think neurodiversity. Um, it's not um, a, an allopathic condition, if you like, uh, and mm -hmm. it's not about pathology, but it's just about the way in which uh, people will bring different capabilities into their work, into their social lives for that matter. When we work with people at that level, it's about questioning our own assumptions of what is normal. So it's such a it's such a dangerous question because the only thing that is normal is abnormality. Um, so you know we we get really into dangerous political um, avenues. But tell us about. The, the concept of cognitive diversity, how that influences dynamics in teams, in innovation in the workplace, 
organization and well-being. I don't know. Just play with how that shows up in the work that you do. So uh, I'll give you an example of that happened not so long ago. And this was really, I was coaching an executive. And uh, what I found was, sorry, my phone is ringing. I'm just going to block it. Um, sorry about that. Um, no worries. No. I was coaching a chief executive and uh, they had recruited a member on the board. And during one of the coaching sessions, it was like, oh, tell me about your colleagues. He says, oh, well, you know, in the main, they're great. But, you know, we've had this new person been recruited into, into the board and, you know, he doesn't fit in. So I said, oh, tell me a bit more. What does that mean? Well, it's like, uh, you know, he doesn't laugh at the jokes. He doesn't uh, seem to understand social etiquettes. And, nice. uh, you know, uh, he says, but, you know, his work is good, but he's, I'm not sure that he fits in here. So we explored this idea of what does fitting in mean? Right. And it's like, well, you know, it's like uh, he needs to be able to be more sociable. He needs to be able to uh, be a, a more effective member of the team. And, and so my question then was, so what is the team doing to help him? Mm. Uh, it's a, mm. And suddenly he had to pause to think because all of a sudden, that question had never cropped up because there was always an expectation for others to meet our expectations as opposed to us thinking about how can we create an environment where each one belong and we are accepted uh, and that it's okay to be different. Interesting, interesting. So as I understand, it was more about shifting the the social norms rather than shifting the individual's yeah. cognitive or social style. And how did that work out? Well, actually, I mean, in this case, it, it was good because all of a sudden a conversation had been opened up. And uh, as we progressed through the conversation, one of the things we talked about was, OK, so... Uh, what are you going to do? Because this person is a direct report to you. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, you have a right to certain expectations, but you have a responsibility to also communicate expectations and create an environment where new expectations can be adaptable and malleable. Hmm. This is yeah. so interesting around the culture being malleable as much as the individual's responsibility. <clears throat> We're speaking to a community of neuroplasticians, Jitin, as you are one of us. And <clears throat> tell us about the social neuroscience. Tell us about the neurodiversity. Tell us about how the brain functions in this, in this, I don't know, in this dilemma yeah. in the workplace. So and I mean, without wishing uh, to, uh, you know, teach people to suck eggs, let me go back to cave times. Okay. And, uh, you know, people are tribal and they Pretty live in so. small tribal communities. And there was always a danger. And often the danger was in the external environment, um, you know, T-Rexes appearing, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so, as you'll be aware, you know, Jay, Justin, that... Uh, you know, there's the amygdala responsible for our fight, flight, or freeze uh, elements that would kick in. As a result of that, um, you know, we were trained and customized into those one of those three modes for survival purposes. You know, fast forward to 21st century, and what happens is the amygdala is still that primitive part of the brain that hasn't necessarily caught up. But today's threats and today's, um, uh, you know, security issues are different to what they were in those days. But the amygdala still reacts in a similar way. So anything that's unfamiliar 
uncommon to us and not in our experience can be experienced as a threat. It's so well explained. The, the concept of neurodiversity speaks into other environments like leadership, like innovation, like psychological safety. And I often say to people, we're using outdated software. You know, we're running on a brain that was designed for a different time. And we're still a social organ. The brain's reason for being so intelligent is because its ability to collaborate. And that has uh, byproducts in terms of our ability to facilitate oxytocin in our dynamics to ensure that there is an environment where there is collaboration. So how does that I was going to say up? trust would be the word that I would use. Yes, I love it. Tell us more about that word. So uh, in, in those interpersonal dynamics, whether it's on a one-to-one -one basis or in a team situation, often we don't necessarily um, spend enough time uh, to generate you know, the oxytocin uh, levels, which builds trust across a team. Uh, because we end up, and often a phrase that I use with my clients is, let's replace judgment with inquiry or judgment with curiosity. Tell so, us that story about the CEO and the board member being a bit, a bit different to the rest. That's a great story. Yeah. Would you mind telling it again? Just... Yeah, so in that situation, it was uh, uh, this new board member was different and also you know, there was the element of intersectionality comes into it because he was from a slightly different cultural background to the majority of the board members. Okay. So when you're coaching the CEO, how did that go when you were discussing the board? Yeah. So we talked about, you know, how could he approach this situation? And uh, the thing uh, that we talked about was uh, when you have your one-to-ones with your direct reports, what do you start discussing from the off? Mm. Uh, because you're all busy, uh, you know, senior executives in the business. Um, right. And what happens? And he says, well, you know, when he comes in, I will sort of look at uh, what his objectives were and ask him how he's getting on with them and what, what is upcoming. I say, okay, so that's with him. What about with others? What, where's, where's your start point? I said, oh, with the others, it's like we might talk about uh, playing golf, you know, who was playing football at the weekend. Da, nice. da, 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 da. I said, so why do you not do that with this person? He says, well, he doesn't fit in. Mm. And, and so that's where suddenly the barrier. And I was saying, OK, so what can help him to fit in? What is your conversation starter going to be with this individual at your next one to one? And did you stump him or what happened? And he says, well, I don't know what to talk to him about. So I said, well, may I make a suggestion? Normally, you know, in a coaching, it's more about inquiry, getting them to come out. But sometimes right, right. I need to shortcut it. And so what I did was I said, I'll make a suggestion for you. And I said, why don't you ask him about, uh, you know, what interests him? And maybe mm. preface it first to say, today we're going to do something slightly differently. We're not going to start with talking about objectives and achievements. We're going to, I want to get to understand who you are first. Mm. Uh, I love and it. I love it. In that sense, it was like, and he, I said, you will need to really create the introduction to this. Don't just launch straight in because immediately that person may get suspicious and you know, in, then their amygdala will get uh, activated and suddenly they're in a security and protective mode mm -hmm. as opposed to being in open uh, mode, which generates the oxytocin. It sounds like such a good idea. And <clears throat> I, I know that you're in the embryonic phrases with your new book, but having a handbook for leaders on how to navigate this environment is is such a time a timely topic tell us a bit about your thinking i know it's still premature to dive deeper but tell us a bit about your your thinking around having this handbook for leaders i think it's a wonderful 
uh, book. I can't wait to read it. Yeah, so the, the working title of the book is uh, Elevating Inclusion, and uh, mm -hmm. it follows on from my current book, which is Demystifying Diversity, which is a handbook to navigate diversity and inclusion. So you can see the link there. But right. really, uh, the idea behind this book will be to develop the notion of the inclusion ecosystem. What a nice treat of a title. Yeah. Um, so what does so, the ecosystem mean? That's such an interesting yeah. proposal. So when we think about an ecosystem, we think about all, uh, you know, an environment. And uh, in order for that environment to flourish, there needs to be a balance um, across all elements of that environment. And there needs to be, a, I, I guess the word is interdependence as opposed to dependence. Yeah. Um, so when we start thinking about this uh, inclusion ecosystem within an organization, it also then encompasses the environment that that ecosystem interacts with in the outside world. So part of that in that ecosystem is the customers, the stakeholders, the suppliers, the contractors, uh, all of those people as well. Um, but fundamentally, it's also what happens on the inside of the organization. And, mm. you know, there is this thing about if I always do what I always did, I will always get what I always got. Very good. I love it. But, you know, I, I know we're running out of time and I didn't want to keep you too long uh, to 10, but I have two questions left. Uh -huh. One is what are the next steps in mm -hmm. the NPN Hub? which we can play with together. But yeah. the, 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 the most important question is, what's the point? What's the ROI? How does this stuff help business, you know, yeah. be more effective? So first of all, uh, in terms of businesses being more effective, uh, I would say that uh, most organizations need uh, to think about how are they becoming the employer of choice? Okay. Um, Love it. When you are an employer of choice, then you are going to start reflecting the communities that you serve. And you're going to attract talent, of course, as you're well. You're going to attract the, the talent. You're going to attract uh, people uh, who bring a diversity of thinking, perspectives, um, uh, uh, you know, and that really aids solution seeking. It aids innovation and creativity exactly. in the business. Exactly. Um, I mean, th these are such cool topics. I'm sorry to jump in, but I think this is uh, a beast of a topic. I know uh, Faye Cormick has done some thinking around this, which is very, very much aligned with what you are, are speaking about. So let's, let's have a th quick think about what this should do. First step, have a chat with Faye. Second step, let's do something in the NPN Hub. Maybe it's a, a panel of experts around uh, neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a round table for us to hear more. Maybe it's us all sitting on the bench watching a discussion with you and Faye. But I, I think what I'm trying to say is have a chat with Faye and mm -hmm. come back and let's host a an open event. How does that sound? I would be delighted. I think uh, there's uh, a lot uh, that we can unpack just from this conversation in a more uh, intimate, uh, shall we say, a roundtable discussion with people. Very good. Because Very good. I think, you know, and also thinking about bringing in people from a clinical environment as well as a, a social environment and an organizational environment as well. Ooh, a clinical environment. Stay away from the devil. We'll never get away. Yeah. If we bring the NHS into this, they will crucify us. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually the NHS, uh, you know, there are people in the NHS now who are becoming much more enlightened. Uh, and of course, of course. Uh, I think, you know, when I start seeing uh, inclusion leaders within that environment, they are starting to recognize and think about this not as a pathological condition. And I like to think of it as, um, the social model uh, as opposed to the medical model. The social neuroscience of cognitive 
neurodiversity. Yeah. Nice brief name for us Absolutely, to yeah. think about. You know. it, so anyway, it'll become a good acronym. Exactly. So um, let's um, let's finish up here, Jatin. Have a conversation with Faith. Let's set up a roundtable or an interview or an mm. open dialogue. And let's yeah. uh, let's further this. Is such an important topic. Thank you so much for today. Any final comments or should we round up there, Jatin? I would say my final th thought is something that's attributed to Aristotle. And he said, excellence is an habit, it's not an action. In the same way, I would say that when we think about inclusion, it can't be just a one-off action. We have to really make it a part of our day-to-day -day thinking, acting and behaving. Uh, and that then creates a new norm where everybody is accepted for who they are uh, and not then uh, you know, dismissed because people see them as being on a spectrum. Sure, you've got me on the philosophy now. I can't let go of Socrates, but um, I suppose I have to let you go. But let's bring that into the, the roundtable with Faye and whoever else can join us. So, Jatin, thank you so much, Awan. It's such a thank delight. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will Pleasure. speak soon, my friend. Take care. I hope so. Bye for now. Bye-bye.